We're also going to hear from another investigative reporter and author, Justine Sherrock. Um, you were up for an award at Mother Jones for writing an article in Mother Jones called Am I a Torturer? She's coming at this important question of torture from a little different angle, and that is, what is the effect on torture by the people who are the torturers? And it's a fascinating question, and I think very important to look at that in terms of holding on to our humanity. So I think maybe Justine's going to read some from the book, but that'd be great. We're really anxious to hear from you. Thank you. So to introduce the book, um, I first decided to interview uh, the soldiers who engaged in torture because I heard so many people who wouldn't believe what the detainees were um, saying about what happened at places like Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib. So I figured that to get the message across to um, so many people in America who support torture, it would be best to hear from the soldiers themselves. Um, and I thought, what would be more powerful than to hear their, their side of it? Um, but then I was surprised um, when I started interviewing them that it wasn't just the horrors of the acts that they did, but in fact their own experiences, especially as low-level soldiers who were sent off um, to fight a war, which they thought was a heroic way to save their country, only to find themselves being um, asked to cross moral lines. Um, and they, some of the soldiers in this book are the um, most vocal, powerfully vocal protesters of the torture program, which I think speaks volumes. Um, they really became um, disillusioned with their country and with the military and just felt very betrayed um, and cast aside. Um, and the other thing that I found through this recording is I went around the country interviewing those soldiers and interviewing people in the communities that they came from, their families, other people in their towns, other soldiers in their unit, was just the support for torture, um, which, especially living somewhere like Berkeley and San Francisco, we're in this great bubble where you forget how many regular Americans support torture. Um, and I found that the soldiers, instead of hiding their guilt about what they did, had to hide the fact that they were, um, that they protested what happened. Um, so I'm gonna read a little bit about uh, Chris Arm, who worked at Guantanamo. Um, he got there in 2004. Um, some of you might have heard about him because he did a tour around the UK uh, with Roseanne Begg, who's a former detainee, uh, as a way to try and shed light on what happened. Um, when I first met Chris, I was shocked that he had um, been a, a torturer because he just looks like an indie punk rock kid. He's, um, and he was 17 when he first signed up. Um, with his parents' permission. Um, and it just spoke um, to how the people who are doing this are just regular Americans, um, not the sort of hardened criminals with uh, sick, masochistic minds that uh, you would think. Um, because it's not just them, as we know, um, it's, uh, they're just one pawn and larger program that's been created by people like John Yu. So the section that I'm going to read, it starts off where Chris had just been taken off the blocks um, because he was caught talking with the detainees, which is against the rules. While working on the blocks, Chris had never understood why so many detainees had to be moved from one cell to another, often on the same block for no apparent reason. But now, looking at the massive grid in the list, he saw the larger scheme behind it all. On the blocks, Chris had never moved the same guy twice in a row, but now he saw that certain detainees, called the frequent flyers, were being moved from one cell to another every few hours as part of the sleep deprivation program. 
He also realized that some detainees were left in interrogation rooms for entire days in stressed positions without food or water, with freezing temperatures and raucous noise to defecate on themselves without ever being visited by an interrogator. From his position in the office, Chris was able to see the larger picture of the detainee operations at Guantanamo. He understood how each individual seemingly small act was part of a larger machine that had been created to destroy the prisoners. It was something that is purposely hidden not only from the public at large, but even from the soldiers working there. As a non-commissioned officer from Chris's unit explained, when war is written in history, it is in broad terms, but for soldiers there, your scope is three feet in front of you, and that is what you understand. Although Chris was still barred from the interrogation rooms, from his vantage point he saw that what was happening at the camp was torture. Modern day warfare isn't just about bombs blowing off limbs, but minds breaking down. When Chris realized the magnitude of the larger system of abuse and torture, he tried to use his position at the office to make things easier for the detainees. He gave priority to orders to transfer prisoners out of interrogation rooms as soon as the session was over. If detainees complained that the spray of the military-grade mace from the five-man riot squad attacks was bothering them, he moved them to a different block. Moving one detainee because his toilet was blocked up, sparing him from momentary suffering, came to seem so futile, he explains, when you consider that regardless, the man is still in a concentration camp. Let me tell you a big secret, Chris says one night. Most of us didn't really care about the detainees. Every once in a while, Chris would let himself imagine what happened to the shackled men behind the closed door of the interrogation rooms. But most of the time, he was concerned about his own survival. His schedule was pretty booked, he says. There wasn't a lot of time for existential and ethical dilemmas. Sending someone to the interrogation rooms or ordering sleep deprivation didn't feel like a big deal. I wasn't even sending people, he explains. I was sending numbers. It wasn't Bozan Bed, it was 558. Detainee 555 had to go to the gold room for an interrogation. Package number 1002 had to be transferred to a different cell block every four hours. It wasn't so hard. Well, I want to ask a question of Andy and Justine and Maro. And that is, you know, in the context of our mission to go out and challenge people to take responsibility to stop this, um, I think it's important to look at why we're doing what we're doing. So how did you come to create these works that you've created? Yeah, for me, I was just really shocked and angry when um, I found us as a country debating whether or not we should use torture. Um, it, it wasn't even a question of do we torture, but should we? Um, and I heard that um, not just from people like Dick Cheney on, or talking heads on television, but um, when I went down to visit the hometown where a lot of the soldiers from Abu Ghraib were from, a lot of people there really supported torture and were more angry with the one soldier who blew the whistle on Abu Ghraib than they were um, with the soldiers who engaged in abuse. In fact, they put, um, the whistleblower, Joe Darby, had to go into hiding in a sort of quasi-witness protection program because people were so angry with him for outing the abuse. Um, but it wasn't just people in Red America. Uh, when I was at Columbia, I took a counterterrorism class um, in the International Policy School, and they asked, uh, the professor asked, who here disagrees with the use of torture in trying to counter terrorism? And I was the only one that raised my hand. And these are the people that are go, going on to take positions in government. And you think that someone in university at that point, you're supposed to be somewhat idealistic. Um, so, yeah, I just it's shocking to me that we've reached this point in our country. And I really wanted to go out and meet those people and find out how they're justifying this. Um, and the other side was reading through all the reports and CIA memos and the um, Standard Operating Procedure Manual, which highlights to a disturbing degree the specific torture techniques to use. Um, it was in such a sterile language, talking about these really horrific incidents. So I wanted to, the 
put the reality behind the, those memos and, and just find out what it really was like to be working there.